start the recording and we will get started. A few housekeeping things just to mention. Uh, my colleague Jen is here and she will be uh, monitoring the chat box and interrupting me as necessary. Uh, and so please put your questions in the chat. We have everybody muted right now, just uh, to keep down on the background noise. And so, but feel free as I'm talking to, to throw questions in the chat and interrupt me. I'm, I'm glad to answer questions. So tonight's Nature Night is How Did the Salamander Cross the Road? With your help. And it is a presentation about the Amphibian Migration and Road Crossing Project, which is a collaborative project with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Hudson River Estuary Program, Cornell University, and we are one of their project partners, helping them to coordinate volunteers in uh, Columbia County. So let's get started. The Columbia Land Conservancy, for those of you who may not be familiar with us, is a nonprofit organization with headquarters in Chatham, with the mission of working with the community to conserve the farmland, forest, wildlife habitat, and rural character of Columbia County while strengthening connections between people and the land. And Nature Night was a way, was, was born a couple of years ago as a way to connect people to nature in the colder months and from the comfort of our office in Chatham. And while we obviously can't do that right now, we're excited to be able to continue these via Zoom and be able to have so many more people join us and uh, expand the, the reach and the discussions that we have about nature. And so we're very glad that you're here. And before we get to our formal program, I would like to read a land acknowledgement provided by the Stockbridge Muncie Cultural Affairs Department. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people here in Columbia County. They are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So thank you for listening to that. And as I mentioned, Tonight's presentation is about the Amphibian Migrations and Road Crossing Project. And this is an effort that has been going on since 2009, and it is overseen by the Hudson River Estuary Program. And we've been working with them for, I don't know, I'd say the past eight or nine years to help provide training exercise, training um, workshops and help people find locations so that they can go out and help these adorable little frogs and salamanders cross the road. Before we get started on the, the amphibian migration and road crossing project, I thought I would give you a little bit of background. Oops, I've lost my cursor. There it is. Uh, about what, why, why, why we're doing this, and more so about the habitats that these creatures need. So, broad picture: what is a wetland? The DEC defines a wetland as areas saturated by surface or groundwater sufficient to support distinctive vegetation adapted for life in saturated soil. So. There are, oops, did I miss the slide? No, I didn't. Um, there's a variety of definitions uh, about wetlands, but as this definition states, it's about three main components. There's saturated 
soils. And those are unique from the upland soils. So there's water, soils, and the vegetation. And as this picture shows, you've got quite a lot of different vegetation than you would see in the upland. So, wetlands offer, oh geez, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm trying to move the, the bar off of my screen and I can't, there we go. Um, wetlands provide a lot of function and value to our ecosystems, including clean water, flood control, erosion control. They provide lots of features for habitat, recreation, and more. And um, wetlands in New York State are protected through the New York State DEC, but those for the most part are only wetlands greater than 12.4 acres in size. And then that also includes a hundred foot buffer around it. And then from the federal standpoint, the federal jurisdiction protects wetlands um, connected to permanent waterways. And that leaves many of these isolated wetlands unprotected. Uh, this is a map of the wetlands in Columbia County. This is a natural resource inventory that we helped the county create. And it shows uh, both the National Wetland Inventory wetlands as well as areas of probable and possible wetlands. So this is important because while the wetlands are mapped by New York State and the US Fish and Wildlife Service through the National Wetlands Inventory, Many of them don't show up uh, and the data is sometimes inaccurate because it's done with remote sensing. So there's not a lot of field checking of these wetlands. And it also often misses these small wetlands which are necessary for the uh, amphibians that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So in addition to those small wetlands, not being mapped, those ones that are mapped are often not protected. And many um, of these have really great ecological value, which we'll talk about in a minute. And they could be protected under local laws, but many communities don't even know where they are. So part of this project is helping the animals get across the road, but also part of the project is to identify where these wetlands are so that in the future, municipalities could protect them with local wetland laws. So what kind of wetlands do we have in Columbia County? We have a lot. We have wet meadows, ends, emergent marshes, riparian wetlands, hardwood swamps, kettle shrub pools, springs and seeps, beaver ponds, which is what's shown here in this picture, and woodland pools. So woodland pools are the wetland we're gonna focus on this evening because they're different from a lot of those other wetlands listed. They, there's three components that generally make up a woodland pool. They're the setting, the water, and the wildlife. So for setting, generally these are small wetlands as mentioned before, less than one to two acres, and they are often surrounded by forests, which is why they're called woodland pools. They've also referred to as vernal pools by many people because they generally fill up in the spring uh, with the thawing of snow and spring rains like we are having this evening. For water, the important parts are that they are isolated there's generally no inlet or outlet unless there's a really major flood, but there's not a constant running water through the body of, of the woodland pool. They tend to be shallow, less than a few feet deep, and go through a wet dry cycle. So this picture is actually of a woodland pool that is in the fall and it has dried up. And so that's important for the next feature of the woodland pools the wildlife. And so these are some pictures from 
woodland pools around Columbia County. And one of the important features uh, for the wildlife that uses woodland pools is that these bodies of water do not support fish. And they, so they don't have that predator uh, pressure that they would if they were in a pond. They also provide important breeding habitat for some of the amphibians shown here and invertebrate species like the fairy shrimp, which is in the bottom left. And they also are great foraging habitat for many other species. Uh, there's, I've heard woodland pools being referred to as the coral reef of the Northeastern forest because they provide this really important uh, connection to all of these different ecosystems. So the upland woods, this great nursery breeding ground for these amphibians, and then lots of other things come and eat the eggs and drink the water. So they're really important for our, uh, our whole habitat and ecosystem. So why you're all here, why is this important and how can you help? Amphibians are declining throughout the world. And New York State DEC has identified several of these species of woodland pool breeding amphibians as species of greatest conservation need. There are threats to these populations, uh, including habitat loss, the woodland pools, as you could see in that one picture from the fall. Uh, often, once they've dried up, they don't really look like much. And so there's a, there's a lot of pressure and loss of those types of habitats. There's also habitat degradation where people will dig out the pools because they think they would rather a pond uh, or they fill them in. Roadkill is, road mortality for these, these critters is very high as well as um, there are some diseases that are impacting some of the uh, amphibians in the Northeast. Why am I not able? So there's a decline in amphibians. Okay. The world. So a lot of it has to do with the fact that they cross the road and are killed by traffic. Okay. So now on to the amphibian migration and road crossing project. I'm going to provide an overview of the project and what to do when you're out and some tips and tricks um, and then how we can help you uh, as, as you go out and on a cold rainy night to look for frogs and salamanders. So as I mentioned, this project started in 2009 and since then there have been over 550 volunteers throughout the Hudson Valley. This is a Hudson Valley project uh, so there's 10 counties that the Hudson River Estuary Program works with. And throughout the Hudson Valley, 550 volunteers have counted close to 30,000 amphibians and observed 20 different species when they've been out. So these observations build our understanding of where the habitats for these vulnerable species are. And as I mentioned, this information can be used in local planning and zoning efforts to then protect the habitat because salamanders and frogs, salamanders like the spotted salamander pictured here, uh, cannot survive without these woodland pools. That is their, their sole breeding habitat. So what do you do to participate in this project? What is the first thing to do? Look at the weather. The, Frogs and salamanders that we're hoping to help cross the road will start migrating on a night kind of like tonight. There's, there's a chance that there might be a migration going on this evening. Generally speaking, the ideal conditions are wet, above 40 degrees Fahrenheit uh, after dark, so after sunset. And so, that's like ideal conditions for a frog and salamander. It's not ideal for many people. So 
you will want to be prepared and we'll go through some of the things you'll want to bring with you as part of this. But this is the 10 day forecast for Chatham. So this evening is, is a possibility. And so I appreciate you all being here with me this evening to learn about this program. And then next week actually looks really good too. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll be keeping an eye on the, the weather and, and send out some email updates. But like I said, generally you're looking for above 40 after dark. And, and so you wanna look at the, um, the hourly schedule. So if it starts to drop really quickly, there may still be some movement, but not as much as if it were above 40 for a few hours after dark. So next you're gonna look at, if you're in the Hudson Valley in New York, I know we've got a lot of people, or I saw a few people in the chat say they were coming from out of state or um, outside of the Hudson Valley. And I can try to help you find programs in your area uh, after the presentation. But if you're in the Hudson Valley, you're gonna want to go to the Amphibian Migration and Road Crossing website on the DEC page. And there's a number of short videos that you can watch. We're gonna walk through some of the steps that they talk about, but if you feel like you don't, um, you don't remember what I said, or you need a refresher, there's loads of information. And so you'll want to look at that before you go out. Then there's a number of safety measures because while we want to save as many frogs and salamanders as we can, your safety comes first. And so as shown in this picture, this is the ideal gear for how you want to, to be out in, on a, on a um, road crossing project. So first step, bring a buddy. And if this person that you bring with you is not part of your COVID pod, make sure to wear masks and distance. Um, we want everybody to stay safe all around. So as I mentioned, cold and rainy is ideal for frogs and salamanders. You want to wear layers of you know, weatherproof clothes and layers. Safety vests, headlamps, you probably want something stronger than your cell phone flashlight and you probably don't want to have your cell phone out the whole time you're um, out helping critters cross the road. So, um, you know, those lanterns that you can hold, those are really good because cars can also see them. Any of those sort of torch um, flashlights are really good when you go out. Really important points. Um, we can't interfere with traffic or try to stop drivers from going, you know, where, where you know there's an active migration. Um, it's just not something that that the uh, Amphibian Migration Project wants people to do. You can talk to people about what you're doing, but please don't interfere with traffic. There, on the website, there is a project fact sheet. Uh, we recommend printing out a bunch of those and bringing them with you. When I was out, um, you know, I had a few people stop last year and um, you know, was able to give them the flyer and they thought it was really interesting and talked about how they had also seen frogs and salamanders on the road and were grateful to know about the project. So another resource on the website is this amphibian identification guide. And we will go through some of these in a little bit, but these are really handy to take with you because the data that the project wants is uh, they want accurate data on what you're seeing. So you will be seeing a number of things and some of the things look similar. So this guide is very handy. It also has a ruler on it and um, some other information. I recommend uh, laminating it if you have that ability to do. Um, and for those of you who are local, we do have some of these laminated identification sheets and I can figure out a way to share them um, with folks if they need a copy of them. So just get in touch with me and I can 
I can get you some of these. So more about what to bring. As I mentioned, lanterns, flashlights, headlamps, those blinking lights that you see cyclists using. You really, again, here's a great picture of people out with lots of safety gear. And in addition to safety, the flashlights are really helpful for seeing the little critters on the road. You will need a data form, some scrap paper, clipboard, pencils. The data will actually get entered ideally into their online data submission platform. But if you don't want to have your phone open and out in the rain, what I do is I tend to have a clipboard and my buddy was, stayed in the car and I would yell back to her what I was seeing and she would write it down. Um, and it's helpful to have, if you have multiple people that each person has a distinct job so that you know somebody's moving, somebody's counting, something like that. The laminated ID sheets that I mentioned just before, the project fact sheet, and a clean container or scoop can be helpful if you have a really active section of road where you need to, you know, put critters into a bucket to carry them across instead of taking them one by one. Now, spatula. Unfortunately, there is road mortality, which is one of the things we're trying to avoid, but we do want that data also. The project, it, it's helpful for the project to know how much road mortality there is in a certain, in a section of road, because then that helps with the overall numbers. So a spatula or, um, you know, a, a, a small shovel to move the dead amphibians off the road so that they don't get double counted. Um, sometimes when you're walking back and forth, moving am live amphibians, it can sometimes be confusing as to whether or not you counted that, that one that was there. So kind of gross, but helpful. And a camera protected for rain. Uh, you will wanna take a representative photo of the species that you're seeing as part of the data collection. And the project would love to see more photos like the one here of volunteers out and especially with all of the safety gear. So where are you gonna go? If you don't already have a crossing identified, you're gonna wanna look for some features on the landscape. And one thing that you can do, and it might be a good idea to do early next week here in Columbia County, as the temperatures are warming up, you might wanna drive around during the day and do a windshield survey. And so look for areas that are forested and you know, maybe there's a wetland near the road. So what you're gonna to wanna to look for is forested areas on both sides of the road. And that's because these amphibians, the, the mole salamanders and the wood frogs in particular, live in the upland woodlands around the, the woodland pools. They only go to those woodland pools to breed. So the rest of the time they're in the woods and that's why they have to cross the roads to get to these wetlands. So drive around. And like I said, early next week when it's getting up into the 50s, you're gonna start hearing peepers, you're gonna start hearing wood frogs. And that's a good indication that there could be a woodland pool nearby. Some of these, the male wood frogs will come out earlier and on the cooler nights and go to the woodland pools first. So drive around and take a look and see if you see any of these sorts of features. You can also check aerial photos similar to this one, um, other maps, local studies, the natural resource inventory that I mentioned before. There is an online mapper, a tool that you can use where you can actually zoom into your neighborhood and look for features. So this 
dark spot in the middle of that yellow circle is likely a woodland pool and it's a small wetland that may not show up on some of the other wetlands maps. So that's a great resource for Columbia County. Other counties have similar resources and I'll share a link to the online mapper in what I send out next week. So in here in Columbia County, again, uh, we can help you narrow down where, what you're looking in your area, excuse me. So a couple of years ago, I had created the map on the left for these potential sampling areas, mostly based on the people that had come to a training that year. And we have the ability to look at some of this data and the aerial maps. And so just let me know where you are and where, you know, how far you're willing to drive and we can help get you a little closer or, or um, you know, point you in the right direction. So you've found a crossing, now what? You are going to park in a safe space um, away from where you see the amphibians moving. You want to, to keep your car away from them if possible, but also be respectful of private property. Don't park in anyone's driveway or block their driveway. And keep an eye underfoot. So before you even, once you step out of your car, just keep moving your flashlight around. Uh, once you, know what to look for. And once you've been out there, you will start to see, uh, you'll start to see them and the, the, the frogs in particular are pretty apparent once they start hopping. Um, and then as much as possible, keep your feet on the street. Once you move the amphibians to the side of the road, they start to blend in with the vegetation and it's really hard to, to see them once they're in the, the grass. So as long as it's safe, stay on the street. So you found an amphibian. Now what? You are going to make sure your hands are clean and wet, but free of any chemicals. So if, if you've just um, used hand sanitizer, you know, maybe have your buddy move the, the critter if they haven't. Um, you can use nitrile gloves but they still, you still want them to be a little moist. So the amphibians, um, you know, they have, they breathe through their skin and they, it can be harmful to them for any chemicals. Um, so make sure, so what I basically do is I wipe my hands. If it's not raining hard, I'll wipe my hands in the wet grass and pick them up and move them that way. Um, so if it's alive, pick it up and move it in the direction it was heading they know where they're going and you know even if some of them are heading the other direction just move them in the direction that they're heading sometimes it's confusing because they're pointed down the middle of the road and so in that case you might have to make a call but generally it's pretty clear and as i mentioned if it's dead use the spatula or a scoop to remove it from the road but record all of it, every species, number of species and alive or dead. So you've been out, you've helped lots of frogs and salamanders cross the road. You get home, warm up, fill out your data form online if possible. It's really helpful to the project if you can submit it as close to real time as possible, because that provides them an opportunity to share with others in the Hudson Valley kind of real time data. So if people downstate are seeing more, you know, they'll, they'll send an email out and say, you might wanna go out the next rainy night because it's likely gonna be happening up farther north. And it also is um, helpful because then, you know, you don't forget 
or, you know, look at your notes and say, I have no idea what I wrote. The image on the right is the data form. And there's an online, there's a link right on the front of the website. And I'll send the link out in what I send out. It's very easy to do. They did a really great job of um, kind of making it streamlined and easy to fill out. So you'll fill out when you started, when you ended, the temperature, and when you started and when you ended, all of the species that you saw, and then there's a Google map that you can pin where you went. And so that's all really important information. If the form is not working or you're not able to use the online data form, you can submit your observations on a paper data sheet that you can download from the website. You'll need to create a map and then email and scan it. Um, I mean, scan it and email it to the, uh, the website listed there. And important for their project also is submit data, even if you didn't see any. If you thought there's a wetland, this could be a potential crossing. That information is also really helpful to narrow down where we send volunteers out in future years. There's a question kind of related to that. Um, sure. Someone asked um, if we have a vernal pool um, by, but may not be available to help a crossing, who should we let know um, where the road and pool are located? Is it in Columbia County? Yes. <laughs> uh, feel free to email me. And um, Jen, if you could put my email in the chat, um, we, can, we can help with that. Thanks. Okay, so now we'll do a little overview of all of the species. Well, not all, but most of the species that you will see if, um, if you go out. So, all right, hold on. There we go. All right, this is a one of my favorites, of course, uh, the spotted salamander. And they are generally about five to eight inches, dark gray, black body, two rows of yellow spots, kind of hard to miss. They actually stand out so surprisingly. I, you know, I can see them with my headlights of my car sometimes. Um, and they have a widespread distribution in the Hudson Valley. They're pretty common, uh, although you're not necessarily that likely to see them on a hike in the woods because in the absence of a migration, they tend to be underground most of, most of the rest of the year or under logs in leaf litter, like this one's pictured. So you might not think that they're that common, but they actually are, are quite widespread. So next, we have another of the mole salamanders. And these are in the category of mole salamanders uh, because as their name suggests, the group suggests that they live underground and often will use mole tunnels in the woods. So this is on the left, the Jefferson salamander and the blue spotted salamander. And these have asterisks because they often hybridize. And so on the data sheet, you will see, I believe it just says Jefferson slash blue spotted. Um, they have, they're generally three to seven and a half inches, brownish gray, black with blue speckling, and they are less common than the spotted salamander. Another potential, well, this is another of the, Jefferson blue spotted salamander complex. So in, in this picture, you can see that it's pretty much all gray. It doesn't have that blue spotted. This is a wood frog. These are um, kind of little frogs. 
ranging in size from one and a half to three inches, light tan to brown body. They have that dark raccoon mask across their eyes and they have the distinct ridges along the back. They're very common. If you go out to uh, you know, drive around early next week, you might hear what sounds like quacking ducks, but it's actually the wood frogs calling. So, let's see. Next we have the green frog. And this is not uh, considered a woodland, woodland pool um, obligate species. It doesn't need, it, it can lay its eggs in many different types of wetlands, but you may see them out. So it's good to know what they look like and know what to look for. Um, they have variable coloration, usually green to bronze often with dark molting and they have ridges that extend from the eyes to two thirds down their back. Bullfrogs have a very similar look, but they lack those ridges. They are also very common. Oops, okay. This little guy is a spring peeper. And their total length is about a half to half inch to one and a half inches. They are a small, our smallest tree frog, and they have a small body with smooth skin. And it's usually light brown, but they can be gray or olive. You'll notice they have what looks like an X on the back. Their underside is pale, and they have little toe pads because they're tree frogs. Uh, they're also very common. And another one that doesn't require vernal pools or woodland pools for breeding, but they will use them and are, are sometimes a good way to locate pools. This is a gray tree frog and uh, they have a green to grayish body, rougher skin, dark blotches, yellow inner thighs with light spots and a dark edge beneath their eyes. They're very common in Columbia County. Um, again, that you may see them out when you're helping other critters because this, this type of weather is what they all love. Okay, now we have the American toad um, and they are stout, rough skinned, with variable coloration, usually reddish brown. Um, they have dark warty spots and they're very common. And I'm trying to remember if I saw toads out when I was out, but they there are Fowler's toads in some parts of the Hudson Valley and they appear very similar. As far as I know, there's not many instances of those in Columbia County. Oops, where'd my cursor go? So we're gonna do a quiz. So I think if you wanna put in the chat what you think each species is, and Jen can tell me what, what people think. So if you're out on a cold rainy night like tonight, and you find this little guy, what do folks think it is? It's looking like people are saying wood frog. Yes. So this has the, there's a dark mask and it's got that ridge down its back. Um, you can see there is some variation from some of the other pictures that we showed, but yeah, great. All right, next. We didn't actually show, I didn't show any pictures of, of this guy. I don't know if. Um, we have red eft, Eastern newt. Yes, red very newt. good. So again, you know, most people have seen them out when, uh, you know, you're hiking after a rain um, and, and they may be out on the roads. 
move them with everybody else and make sure you take note of it. So we did, we did this was one of the pictures I already showed. We have toad, gray tree, fo tree frog. Yep, this is the gray tree frog. It does have very similar coloration to the, the toad, the American toad. The challenge with these pictures, I realized as I was putting them in, is that they're not to scale. So this looks huge and really it's, you know, I mean, that's somebody's finger, so it's not that big. But um, yeah, so this is the gray tree frog. Okay, next. And these ones are hard to see in the road. Um, we have Jefferson's blue spotted. Um, yep, this is one that we would we would say on the forum is the Jefferson blue spotted complex. And uh, so that's good. All right. Another little guy. Any guesses? Um, spring peeper? Yes, that's right. So, you know, and you can see this, this is one that I had moved when I was out. They're tiny. Um, and so if you're out and there are a number of species, the bucket is helpful to, you know, put them in and then, you know, let them crawl out of the bucket on the side of the road. So, so would you say the difference between like that one and like, cause it could kind of has like the mask, like a wood frog, mm -hmm. but the difference is the size. That definitely is the size. Yep. That's a great question. And also on the back, it has that X, the, the markings look like an X, but generally this is, this would be a, a full grown spring peeper. And whereas the, the wood frog is probably three times that size. So next we have, and this one we didn't talk about either, but it is on the ID guide that you can download from the project website. Um, we have zebra salamander, um, a newt, um, slimy, four toed. Good guesses. So the this is actually a um, redback salamander. It, I think the the picture is a little deceiving, but you can see the red on its tail. But the four toed salamander has a similar color and pattern to what you see here, and so that's where the the ID guide is really handy because then you can see the different features and how to tell them apart when you're out in the field. Okay, another one not out on the road, but one you might see. Um, we have bullfrog or green frog. Yep, this is a green frog and you can't really tell in the picture, but it's got the little ridges on its back. Okay, and this might be the last one. Um, spotted salamander. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, figured, you know, end with an easy one. So yeah, so these, um, as I mentioned, the yellow spots stand out, uh, especially once you have, a, when you have flashlight out. Uh, and And sometimes like if you are driving along, you might even see them with your headlights and can stop and move, help them move along. So, no, oh, I was wrong. Another one. One more. Wood frog seems Wood to be frog. the consensus. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And that's a good representation of where it has that little raccoon mask. So, for those folks that are in, well, any, anybody can join, um, but the way that Columbia Land Conservancy is trying to coordinate the Columbia County project is 
through a platform called Mobilize. And this is just a screenshot of our site and you can go to our, our website and sign up. And this is where we will be sharing information about the local conditions, where uh, there's a resources tab where I've saved some maps of the, the area where you can go and look to see where some potential crossings are. We're encouraging people to chat with each other and say, hey, I'm gonna be, you know, I'm in Greenport and I could use a buddy. Does anybody wanna go out? So, so instead of people emailing me directly and trying to coordinate that way, we, we are trying this new platform this year and people are still welcome to email me because I, it, it is new and we're working out the kinks, but um, please join. And that way you can sort of keep up on how we are um, sharing information. And now that's all the presentation I have. So I thought we could open it up to questions. And if people want to unmute to ask questions, that's fine, or put them in the chat, that's fine too. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just so that I can see everybody. Um, we had a question sure. about where someone can buy a safety vest. That's a good question. Um, I would say probably, well, Tractor Supply, stores like that might have them. Uh, if you're here in Columbia County, um, I have some that I can lend out. And again, reach out to me via email and we can coordinate. You know, I can either put it in the mail or we can leave it by our office door. And we've got, we've got some safety vests that we can share as part of the project. It looks like someone also suggested Walmart, so that might be a place to check yeah. too. I was going to even say Agway might. <laughs> Other questions? So as I was saying in Columbia County right now, or where I am in Copake anyway, there is, um, it's raining and it's above 40 right now. So it would be potentially a good night to, to go out. The ground is still somewhat frozen. So they might not, there might not be what used to be considered a big night migration where there was, you know, hundreds of them but uh you know so if folks around here are interested you could easily at least go start taking a look um um we have a question about how big is the salamander range sure so they range you know some of those smaller ones the the redback salamanders are you know a couple of inches three inches and the the mole salamanders are up to you know eight nine inches the so some of them are harder to see and especially blend in well with the with the road but um someone asked about if there's a website for duchess county or a resource for that area so Dutchess County would go through this same amphibian migration and road crossing page in terms of all of the resource guides, the, the ID guides that has the same, they have essentially the same salamanders that we do. In terms of location, locating potential road crossings, um, their county website has an online mapping tool like the one that I mentioned that Columbia County has. So um, I can I can find that and put it in the follow-up email. Okay, um, and then we have about how long is the window of migration activity? And then kind of similarly, 
um, what time after dark is best, uh, early evening or later? Yeah, both good questions. So the the window of time um, in terms of start to finish of a of the my, the whole migration, the whole spring migration, could be anywhere from. So I would say now is is the starting point. Generally, it's the end of mid to end of March through the mid to end April. Um, you're going to see bigger migrations earlier in the migration window. So in the next couple of weeks, the next rainy nights head out and you will likely see some migration and then it'll start to dwindle off. They tend to move, you know, as soon as it starts to warm up and, um, and, and if the conditions are right. And then in terms of actual hours in which the migration occurs during a day, again, there's, there's variability, um, but the recommendations are to go out after sunset and um, stay out as long as it's above 40, because those are ten that tends to be the window of time in which the amphibians are more likely to move. And you should feel like stay out as long as is comfortable for you. Don't um, you know, you do not have to stay out until midnight. Traffic generally slows down after, you know, 10 o'clock in most areas around here. Uh, so I would say, you know, I think when I headed out last year, it was probably around 7, 7.30 and, you know, stayed out for about an hour and a half, maybe. Uh, and but again, if you go out for 10 minutes, that's great. Record that data. If you go out for three hours, you're a stronger person than I am. <laughs> um, and kind of similarly, someone asked, is it only done when it's raining? Ah, another good question. Um, no. <laughs> Generally, you know, as with everything in nature, there is um, exceptions. Generally speaking, they move when it's raining. Though in previous years, when we've had some of these warmer springs where it's humid or foggy, there will be migrations. They will move. It, it does tend to have to have some moisture in the air. If it's rained all day and then stops, I would still say head out and see because if the road is still wet, or like I said, if it's foggy, there's a good chance that some of them may still be moving. Um, and then we had a question about how far do they migrate? A quarter mile, more or less? Um, I think, again, it depends, but I believe it's it's anywhere up to about a mile or half mile maybe. I'm not remembering. It's a pretty good distance, uh, especially considering how little their legs are. Um, and so I can't say definitively, but it's a pretty good distance. Um, and then we had someone say that help the salamanders cross the road in Red Hook is the Dutchess County group. So if anyone is looking for that. Um, and then we had a question about if you could share your past experiences, like how many amphibians you've seen or which specific things you've seen. Sure, just during the road crossing or in, in, in my life. <laughs> Um, I guess I'd say for, so uh, I went out last year and uh, a lot of those pictures of amphibians in hands were my hands um, taken by my trusty buddy in, in the car, my sister. She took lots of pictures uh, as she collected the data for me. Um, so we saw all of the amphibians, I think that we, went over this evening. Um, so spotted salamander, Jefferson, Sal Jefferson blue spotted complex, uh, 
we actually had an Eastern newt on the road uh, in its adult form. We had lots of peepers, lots of wood frogs, a couple of green frogs. We didn't have any toads. And I think, well, and we had the redback salamander. So, and that pretty much is most of the, the frogs and salamanders in Columbia County. <laughs> um, I think there was also a question um, earlier about if these salamanders were only in New York. If these, all these salamanders? Uh, nope, they're, uh, the salamanders, I think, I'm not totally sure where their range is, um, but it's it's most of the Northeast, I believe. And then wood frogs uh, have a pretty wide, a, a pretty big range. Um, and, but that's a good question. I don't know their full range. Um, we had another question about if they cross all night. I don't know because I don't stay up that late. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, as long as the conditions are good, as long as it's wet and, and warm enough, um, they will, they, you know, and if on a rainy day, you might even see a few moving. Uh, but again, generally speaking, they will, as long as the conditions are right. Um, someone else suggested that a clean dustpan is also a useful tool to, I don't know if it's to scrape or to help get them across. Um, and then we had a question about leopard or pickerel frogs. Um, they said that they've seen them both in Litchfield County. Yep, we do have, uh, we have, pickerel frogs are, are more common in Columbia County, but we do have both of those. And yeah, they could be out and they look similar. Um, and I do think they might be on the ID guide as a, as a potential one that you might see. Um, someone mentioned that when they would be um, home on their way from work at around midnight, they would see frogs. So I think they're probably out late too. <laughs> I think as long as, you know, as long as they need to move or, and want to get to those woodland pools, they will. Um, Do we have other questions? Does anybody that's on have experience crossing that they'd like to share um, their experience? Yeah, I do. Yeah, Joanne, go ahead. That sometimes when you're driving down the road from a distance, they look as if they're the salamanders look as if they're little sticks in the road. Yeah. And that's kind of a good signal to slow down because they could be the salamanders. And I think they need some kind of moisture in the air because it helps their they need that for their skin. Yeah. So as you were saying about humidity or a wet road or but from my experience, that's all. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. It just helps them move across the, the road yeah. and kind of signals to them. Yeah. Um, someone had a question about if there was numbers from um, from last year if that was still available. Um, I can check. So from the training that we did last, last year. Okay, I can look, I, I'm sure we have that somewhere. And then someone else had a stress in our input that frogs and toads look like triangles on side. So and they seem to freeze from car lights um, when they're in the road. That's a good yeah, I think I definitely find myself when I'm driving in, on a rainy night, 
assuming everything is a, a frog or a salamander. And so it takes me a long time to get anywhere. Which that is the other recommendation that if, if you're not going out to help the frogs and salamanders cross the road and you can stay home on a cold rainy night or, or you know, a night like tonight, that's great because then that's one less car on the road potentially. Um, All right. Well, maybe does that, does anyone want to share which amphibian they're most excited to see or hoping to see in the chat? Or feel free to unmute and let us know. We have some wood frogs and toads that people are excited for. Good. Frogs. Any frogs? You know, it's hard to pick. I, I love them all too. We have great tree frogs. And then um, someone said that in Canaan around East Chatham that they're going out tonight. So if anyone's in that area and wants a buddy. Great, thanks, Wendy. So Liz actually posted a good question about are there places near Chatham or Hudson that are a big concern? That's part of why we're encouraging people to go out. In Columbia County, there's not a ton of data of where there are uh, you know, important road crossings. Uh, so getting this data into the database will help us learn more about that. So I would say right now, you know, the Wendy who's joining us from, from East Chatham has been going out for a number of years. And so she has a, a place where she knows there's a good amount of crossing. And there's some other folks that, that do go out and have kind of a, a standard route that they take but i can take a look at some maps and and share those on mobilize uh or send me an email and we can help narrow it down and then you know that just helps build our information for future years for sending volunteers out I just Cheryl's comment of fog, frogs will jump out of your hands. They sure will. <laughs> and um, it's kind of startling the first couple of times. <laughs> so, you know, that is a, that's a good, uh, if, you don't, if you're not putting them into a, a bucket to move them across the road, uh, you might want to make sure you cover your hands. And, and that's very good advice. Any other questions or stories to tell? Feel free to unmute and um, and like I said, we will send out a, uh, a the link to the recording and the resources, and definitely check out our website. Our next nature night is April fifteenth. And it will be about pollinator habitat and supporting our native pollinators. So hopefully you can join us for that. But feel free to unmute and ask questions or share any, anything you'd like. Yes, Wendy, uh, in the email that I send out, I will put a link to the April 15th um, Nature Night.
Yes, Wendy, it does, it does get cold. That is good. It, it, a good reminder to 